שלום וערב טוב לכולם, ברוכים הבאים לערב ההשקה לספר של יאניס ורופקיס, המנותר הגלובלי. לי קוראים אדם חפץ ואני עורך של המגזין פיגומים. אני יונית מוזס, אני עורכת בשיחה מקומית. אנחנו מדברים עליכם חנות הספרים העצמאית סיפור פשוט שבתל אביב, היא מארחת אותנו, גם אותנו פיזית וגם בזום. לפני שנתחיל את הרעיון שהתקיים באנגלית, אני רוצה להגיד כמה מילים גם על הספר וגם על הסדרה שבמסגרתה הוא יוצא. הספר המנותר הגלובלי יצא לראשונה ב-2011, ומהדורה השלישית שלו יצאה ב-2015. יסמינה לוי, שאני מקווה שכבר נמצאת איתנו, תרגמה עבורנו את הספר בצורה קולחת ומצוינת, זה הספר. ונלווה לספר גם מבוא מאת דני גוטוויין. הספר הוא חלק מסדרת ספרים חדשה שנקראת בארי, סדרה למחשבה סוציאל דמוקרטית. והספר הראשון הוא כאמור המנותר הגלובלי, וספר נוסף שיצא, שניהם יצאו יחדיו, זה הספר הזה שנקרא כלכלה ויקינגית של ג'ורג' לייקי, והוא מדבר על המודל הסקנדינבי. ערב ההשקה של הספר הזה יהיה בעוד כשבועיים. את שני הספרים אפשר להזמין כבר עכשיו באתר של סיפור פשוט, אפשר לאסוף אותם מהחנות, אפשר לקבל משלוח לארץ ולחו"ל, ואפשר גם להזמין את הספר באתר הוצאת הקיבוץ המאוחד, בקרוב יישלח קישור לרכישת הספרים. יש עליהם מבצע, אנחנו מפצירים בכם לקנות את הספר הזה כמובן, וגם... את הספר הנוסף בסדרה, ככל שיותר אנשים יקנו את, הספ... את הספר, את הספרים, כך נוכל להוציא יותר. <אם> הסדרה היא פרי של שיתוף פעולה בין כמה גופים ואנשים, שחשוב לי לציין אותם בשמם. <אם> קודם כל, לפני כולם, גיורא רוזן, העורך של סדרת קו אדום, מהוצאת הקיבוץ המאוחד, שמהווה כאמור אכסניה לסדרה. בנוסף, אני רוצה להודות למיקי דריל מקרן פרידריך אברט. אירוני כספי ואביעד הומינר רוזנבלום מקרן ברל כצנלסון, דודו אמיתי מיד יערי, ונטע שפירא ודני גוטוויין, שלולא השיחה הראשונית שלהם, הסדרה הזאת לא הייתה יוצאת לפועל. הספר הזה הוא באמת יוצא דופן בזה שהוא מערב, משלב בין כל מיני גופים שונים בשמאל הישראלי, ואנחנו מקווים שתצאו לקנות את הספרים. אוקיי, okay, הערב הזה אנחנו נתחיל בריאיון עם פרופ' ברופקיס, שיימשך 45 דקות, חצי שעה. אחרי זה נפתח את הבמה לשאלות מהקהל. בזמן הריאיון אתם מוזמנים לכתוב את השאלות שלכם בצ'אט או בפייסבוק לייב. נוגה מסיפור פשוט תאסוף את השאלות ותשאל אותן בחלק השני. הריאיון יתקיים באנגלית, הוא יעלה בהמשך עם כתוביות, והוא לא יתמקד אך ורק בספר המינותר הגלובלי, אלא יעסוק גם בספרים נוספים שכתב ברופקיס. ו... So, hello and good evening to economist, former finance minister of Greece, and founder of DM25, Professor Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you so much for being with us. You're, you're, you're muted. muted. Unmuted, as we all should be these days. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for um, being here. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the translator of the book, to the publishing house. Um, it's, you can imagine how moving it is. Uh, more than a decade after I wrote the book, uh, to, you know, to be experiencing this tonight. So, thanks. Um, so, as, as Yonit mentioned in her comments in Hebrew, uh, our discussion will not only be about the translation of your book, your new book, uh, your, excuse me, your old, old book, book. but also on some political questions and your new book, Another Now, which just recently uh, was published. But let us start with the Global Minotaur, which seems to me to frame your understanding of the past and possible future of the global political economy. So the title of the book is The Global Minotaur, which is a famous uh, creature from Greek mythology. Can you explain what, what is the Global Minotaur and how does it explain the trajectory of the global economy prior to, to the 2008 crash. Well, th thanks for the opportunity to recount uh, the history of the title of the book. Uh, and if I spend a little bit, bit more time talking about it, it's because there is an Israeli connection to it. Uh, back in the 1990s, um, when I was living in Australia, in Sydney, uh, teaching at the University of Sydney, um, I would spend quite a few hours every day uh, debating, discussing, fighting with, agreeing with, disagreeing with um, a great friend and colleague at the University of Sydney, 
uh, who goes by the name of Joseph Halevi. So there, there's your connection. Uh, Joseph and I would um, um, stay on, uh, just goes to show what kind of relationship we had or didn't have with the outside world, um, well into the night um, after five o'clock in our offices, on the same corridor of the Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney. Sometimes we would stay, you know, until 10, 11 at night and then go out and have a Turkish pizza. Uh, and, uh, you know, we would debate the state of the world from an economic, political, point of view, with a great emphasis on, you know, the perspective from the Eastern Mediterranean, because this is where we both came from. Um, and uh, it was around 2001, 2001, 2002, when um, a decade of discussion and disagreement between us, uh, both of us coming from the left, by the way, right? But, you know, the, we had the kind of disagreement, serious bigoting, that only leftists can have with one another, right? <laughs> um, but that disagreement was merging, merging, sort of blending into an agreement, and more than anything else. And I think that is important to understand the book. A worry. We were beginning to get worried. Uh, the, the conversation was no longer between two Marxists talking about, you know, the, 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 how capitalism produces crisis, capital accumulation, um, you know, globalization and all those things. No, we were beginning to get seriously worried that fascism was coming back. And the reason why we were worried about that was because we thought that um, we, you know, the data that we were gathering and the mood we were get sort of feeling around the world was that we that the, the period that began in 2000 started looking very much like the 1920s and we started fearing that global capitalism was becoming so irrational that it would have a major spasm very much like 1929 and we know very well what happened after 1929 uh, and it was not we were prophets or anything like that, but we could see that um, financial markets, and in particular the financial sector, were becoming incredibly overheated. Everybody could see that. It wasn't just us. You know, right-wing economists were saying that too. Uh, we could see that uh, there was um, uh, debt-fueled growth in Europe, uh, in the United States, but the debt was becoming increasingly unsustainable. In other words, the bubble that was going to burst. And it didn't look like a normal bubble. Like, you know, capitalism goes through the redemptive recessions, you know, when a bit like a, a bushfire that, uh, that is not catastrophic, that clears up the excess fuel in the forest and therefore helps the forest regenerate. That was not what we were seeing. We were seeing a major catastrophe coming. Um, and the reason why I'm talking to you about this is because the basic idea of the book comes from those conversations. At some point, we started coalescing around the idea that we need to explain what was going on. And the standard explanations from the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, um, and so on, and from, you know, traditional mainstream economics, uh, was rubbish, we thought. Um, it was not just a case of, um, you know, too much debt, it wasn't just a case of uh, too much financialization, uh, too much corruption. All those things were true, but did not explain what was going on. Um, and what Joseph and I did was we, we concentrated on uh, the major change that took place in the global economy in the early part of the 1970s between the, um, the end of the Second World War and the end of the Second World War and 1971, we had one phase, the first phase of uh, post-war development, which was based on a global plan. And to cut this long story short, capitalism was severely constrained by the institutions of Bretton Woods. Uh, bankers were forced to be boring. And uh, what happened was, in a sense, we had a common currency, the dollar. All exchange rates were more or less fixed. 
And it was the United States of America that was uh, balancing global capitalism by using its surplus. The United States economy, let me remind you, at the end of the Second World War, was the only creditor economy, the only economy that was producing a surplus. Surplus exports, surplus credit, and so on. Um, and it was this surplus that was the linchpin, the pylon, on which the global capitalist economy operated, functioned. But that broke in 1971 when Richard Nixon, President Nixon, ended Bretton Woods. And he had to do it, either him or somebody else. Maybe LBJ should have done it earlier, but who cares? Um, for one simple reason, the United States no longer had a surplus. And that is what Joseph and I honed in on, that what happened really was that the United States maximized, increased its, its hegemonic power by boosting its deficits. So not only did going from surplus to deficit not affect, the, you know, not diminish the hegemony of the United States, but it actually increased its hegemony. For the first time in history, a superpower became stronger by becoming a deficit superpower as opposed to a surplus superpower. And, but how, does it do, how, how can that be explained? Well, very simply, because of a recycling mechanism, a very audacious recycling mechanism, the, um, the, um, uh, pro, you know, the, the United States trade deficit was operating like a vacuum cleaner that was sucking into American territory the net exports of the Germans, the German capitalists, the Dutch, the Italians, the Japanese, and later the Chinese ones. That created stability in, that, in the surplus countries of the world, you know, Northern Europe, um, Saudi Arabia exporting uh, oil, and of course, Japan, that was a major net exporter to the United States, and China. But how was this deficit paid for? Because if Israel or Greece has a perpetual crippling, increasing deficit with the rest of the world, at some point we will be you know, bankrupt. Effectively, our currencies will collapse, there will be a capital flight. In the, the United States managed to maintain this hegemony by increasing its deficit because the profits of the capitalists of the rest of the world were flowing back as tribute to Wall Street and Wall Street was recycling it, therefore completing the loop. This is the, the basic thought that um, Joseph and I had. And uh, um, we wanted to write this up as a paper, as, a, as an article. And it was at, 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 at some point that there had to be give, a talk had to be given to a to various people in Australia, in Sydney, in a pub. <laughs> and, you know, in Australia, if you give a talk in a pub, you better put your point across in the next 10 minutes, first 10 minutes, because otherwise there is too little blood in people's alcohol, and, and then that's it, you lose them. So, <laughs> so um, um, I try to think of a metaphor that captures this very complicated story. And that's the answer to your question, but I'm sorry I had to be, to be so long, but that, I couldn't do it otherwise. Um, and the metaphor was, uh, you know, I used the, the, the Minotaur. Uh, because this idea of the, of the superpower, hegemonic geopolitical superpower, right? That um, stabilizes, creates a, something like, like a Pax Americana, you know, creates markets for foreigners, demand for foreigners, but needs tributes from the foreigners, from the rest of the world, to flow back to the hegemon in order to maintain the hegemon. When, uh, that was a basic story that we, were to, we wanted to tell. And um, um, so I thought, okay, the global minotaur. Uh, let me remind you the story of the minotaur. The story of the minotaur is that you have the major superpower of the time, that was Crete, uh, places like Athens and Sparta and the My Mycenae and uh, um, the Phoenicians were important but subservient to the Cretan hegemon. Uh, and according to myth, there was a dirty secret inside the palace in Knossos, in the, in, in the guts of the palace. And the, that dirty secret was that there was this beast, the Minotaur, the result of incest, the child of um, the queen and the bull, you know the story, uh, that was insatiable and could only be satiated by means of human flesh. 
So the Athenians, who were benefiting from, the, from Pax Cretana, and who were, of course, subservient to Crete, were forced to send every year a number of young boys and girls uh, as nourishment for the beast. So this was, you know, the idea that I had, that the global minotaur would be very similar. What would be the nourishment, the boys and girls? It was the profits of the capitalists of Germany, of Holland, of Japan, of China, that had to go as tribute to the United States to satiate the hunger of the great deficits that were keeping global capitalism in rude health. And the dirty secret <laughs> in this story that no other economist was talking about was that the trade deficits of the United States, rather than being something bad, you, know, you talk to, to a German person about deficits, and hey, deficit, this is a bad thing, we don't want deficits, you know. Tighten your belts, they will tell you immediately. No, no, the Americans did not tighten the belt. You know, they increased their deficits. That deficit, the voracious appetite of the American economy for other people's money was stabilizing the rest of the world, the rest of capitalism. And, um, okay, uh, so that was a story that was told. 2002 was, we wrote up and published it in New York in a fantastic little journal, a very historic left-wing journal called Monthly Review. Uh, founded by the great Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff. Uh, Paul had died by that time, but Harry was, uh, gave us a, you know, I mean, it, it was wonderful to get um, a fantastic letter from Harry Magdoff saying this is the best paper he has had for, for years. Uh, so, so that was the story. Now, that was 2002, right? Uh, then, you know, as time went by, by that time I had moved to Greece, and I was not uh, chatting with Joseph every night <laughs> because he stayed back in Sydney. Uh, but I could see that uh, uh, the tsunami of money, the tributes that were flowing from the European Union, from Japan, from China, from Ar Arab countries and so on, into Wall Street, okay, uh, was creating a house of cards. Because when you give Wall Street bankers I estimated it was five billion net, net, every day, every working day, five billion dollars went to uh, Wall Street bankers to do things with it. Now, if you give a banker five billion, even for 10 minutes a day, they will find ways of making the five billion turn into 25 billion or 100 billion. It's called financialization, right? Uh, leveraging, they call it. Um, so the, the, this, this recycling mechanism, on the back of this recycling mechanism, especially on the flow of capital into Wall Street, Wall Street and the city of London were building gigantic houses of cards. And my great worry and Joseph's, you know, that's what we, I, I was watching, happened. it was like a train wreck in sl slow motion. I could see that these houses of cards would at some point buckle and crash. And the great fear I, you know, we had um, um, was that um, when that happens, when the bubble bursts, it, we would have another 1929. And what would that mean? It would mean that we would have a massive financial crisis. The financial crisis would then turn into an economic crisis. The economic crisis would turn into class war against the poor. And then, you know, the left always the most stupid political force in the world, and this is self-criticism, is going to fail to uh, organize people. And the only ones who will organize people are the fascists. There you are. That's a global minute or the story of a worry that turned into a theory. <laughs> okay, so, um, one, just one second. Okay. Uh, you, you, in the book, you emphasize the differences between the monetary systems of the U.S. and the European Union and the consequences that those differences had once the crisis began. So if we can move our focus from the U.S., how did the global financial crisis affect the euro and especially Greece and other southern European countries? Well, um, okay. Um, I'll give you the longer version of the answer to this in order to make it a bit more solid. Um, when, um, when the European Union was, uh, it was built in 1950 
as a cartel of big business. The first name of the European Union, remember, uh, was not the European Union, it was not the European Economic Community, it was the European Communities of Coal and Steel. Very much like OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. A cartel. What's the point of creating a community of coal and steel? You know, it's the first time in history that you had a, something that today is being portrayed as a state, uh, where the citizens are not human beings, but it's their commodities, coal and steel. Uh, the, the point of the, of, of the EU, when it was created, uh, was to create a cartel so that the coal and steel producers, big business, to put it bluntly, uh, would not clash across borders, particularly between France and Germany. That French and German big businessmen, you know, oligarchs, would join forces and create a cartel so they don't fight one another. And that was an American design. Um, my fellow Europeans hate it when I say that, uh, because, you know, they don't like, they, they, there is this uh, um, penchant here in Europe to think of the European Union as a great European achievement. It was not a great European achievement. It was a design by America's New Dealers. End of story. Yeah? The French wanted to decimate the Germans in 1949, 1950. Um, it, it, it was only the Americans who came to, the, to Europe and said to the, to the French, stop doing this. We're not going to destroy more German factories. We're going to allow the Germans to rebuild their industry. Okay? And there's going to be a deal between you folks and the Germans. And the deal is this. The Germans are going to be the factory and you are going to be the administrators. <laughs> if, you, if you want to know why the OECD is in Paris, it's because this is where the administration was going to be based. And with a little bit in Brussels, you know, which the French considered, you know, quasi-French. Don't tell the Flemish that. Um, okay, uh, so that, that, that was it. And, and they banged their heads and they said, you're going to form a cartel. And the cartel was formed. And it was formed under enormous pressure from the United States. Now, the Europeans, of course, wanted peace. We wanted to end the war. The idea that, you know, the you know, big business in France and big business in, in, in Germany and in Holland and in Belgium and in Northern Italy would stop fighting one another, would stop, you know, fueling, uh, uh, stoking the, the, the fires of, of, of war. There's no doubt about that. But the structure of the EU was the structure of a cartel. The comparison with OPEC is very important to answer your question. Because creating a cartel is always very risky and very difficult. Because even if you and I, you know, let's say that I produce whatever, uh, milk, I have a monopoly in milk and you have another mon monopoly in milk or oligopoly in milk, right? Um, and we want to agree not to compete with one another, you know, to set a common price and, 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 and to agree how much you will get in profits and how much I'll get. Then we have to agree on the quantities as well. Once we reach this agreement, which in our it's against the interest of, the, of, of uh, milk consumers, but it is in our interest to, to come to this agreement. But once we come to this agreement, each one of us has a tendency to free ride on the other and produce a little bit more. You know, still a little bit more of the market share of the other. But then if we both do that, then the, the cartel collapses. So cartels are very unstable things. Uh, and imagine how much more unstable it would be if my milk is sold in one currency and your milk is sold in another currency and then the price, the exchange rate between the two currencies fluctuates, it's very difficult to monitor whether we're sticking to the agreement about a common price. So cartels need a common currency. OPEC doesn't have this problem because oil is denominated in US dollars. So whether you're in Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, um, you know, um, Russia, and you're selling oil in the international market, you're selling in US dollars. So you have, there's a common currency for that cartel. In Europe, every country had some currency, but it was the United States in the Bretton Woods era between 1950 and 1971 that effectively fixed exchange rates between the French franc and the Deutsche Mark and so on. So it was as if the, 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 it was as if they, and they were all, all those currencies were fixed to the dollar, which means that it was as if everybody had the dollar. Problem solved. Until on the 15th of August 1971, Richard Nixon blows up Bretton Woods and suddenly prices 
exchange rate starts doing this. You know, the Deutsche Mark goes up, it goes down, the French from the franc, the Italian lira constantly down, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's very difficult to, to, to continue the cartel when there, is these, uh, the, there are these price fluctuations. So from 1971 onwards, the, the European leaders go together and, and, and panic and they said that we have to fix price, uh, exchange rates. Now they did not have the strength and the intelligence of the Americans. The Americans knew how to, 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 you know, to manage a global financial system, right? They were doing it since 1944. The Europeans had no idea. Um, they tried to fix exchange rates. Uh, the, the, there was a number of, you know, it was just a, a comedy of errors, right? They, they created something called the snake. Yeah, it's, I know it's not a very clever name. Then they created the European monetary system that failed. Then they created the exchange rate mechanism at some point said enough. The only way of fixing exchange rates by having one currency, having the, the euro. But, you know, the dollar is a single currency, but there is also a treasury department, you know, there is a federal government that supports the central bank, the Fed. The Fed supports, it's mutual support. You've got two pylons. You've got the government and you've got the central bank and one supports the other, right? And, um, but to have a government, you need to have um, a joint common democracy and you need a common constitution. We have none of those things in Europe. So what they decided to do in their infinite wisdom was to create a common currency without a common state. So we ended up with a monstrosity. We ended up with a central bank, which is common to everyone, which is al alone, the poor thing. They're still living there in Frankfurt, getting cold, get getting lonely. Okay, no state, no state, no counterpart state. You know, if you're Lagarde, Christine Lagarde today, who is the president of the ECB, okay, there is no finance minister you can call, federal finance minister. There is somebody in Brussels, but they are not really. They just have the title. They're, nobody even remembers what his name is. He, by the way, it's Gentiloni. Who cares? Right? Um, it's only by name, the equivalent of the EU's finance ministry. Because there's no finance ministry. <laughs> because there is no federal government. Because there's no constitution, right? So you've, you've got this central bank that does not have a counterpart state. And you've got 19 states that do not have a central bank. Because the ECB is the central bank of Greece, of Italy, of Germany. But in the constitution, in the charter of the ECB, it is explicitly banned. The ECB is banned from bailing out states and bailing out banks. So, you know, it's like it was as if we created, um, imagine taking a car and removing the shock absorbers and then driving it into a pothole. This is what we've done. So, you know, we created the European Union um, currency, the euro, with no shock absorbers and in a manner which guaranteed that there was going to be a crash. Yes, when, you know, we knew that when Wall Street coughs, we will get pneumonia. <laughs> Mixing my metaphors, right? Um, now, as with all cartels, when the going is good, take OPEC again, my favorite example. When the price of oil is going up, OPEC is fine. They get together, they have their lunches, they love each other, because it's easy to distribute profits between members of a cartel. What happens when the price starts going down? They start bickering, the whole thing falls apart. They hate each other, you know? Saudi Arabia turns against Russia. Indonesia turns against Qatar, you know? And the whole thing collapses. So th this is what happened with the European Monetary Union. Between 2000 and 2008, our generation was 1929, everybody was waxing lyrical about this fantastic monetary union. It was a terrible monetary union. It was creating bubbles in Greece, in Italy, in Ireland, everywhere. It was creating stagnation in places like Germany during the good times. And then when the bubbles burst because of Lehman Brothers, because of the collapse of the house of cards that I described before um, in Wall Street, then the German and the French banks went bankrupt. And then immediately the Greek state, which was relying on loans to keep rolling over its debts from Deutsche Bank and Societe Generale, the Greek state went bankrupt. Uh, and, and then, you know, that started a domino effect. And the, it's interesting to compare and contrast 
the response to this global disaster in Washington DC and in Brussels. Because in Washington DC, um, these awful people, like Hank Paulson, who was, you know, George W. Bush's uh, Treasury Secretary, former Goldman Sachs and so on. You know, Ben Bernanke, not an awful person, but, you know, very conservative too. Uh, Tim Geider, awful person. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, J the, the head of JP Morgan, of, uh, of um, you know, Bank of America, of the Citi Group, and so on. they got around the thing. But, you know, whatever I may think of them, they are smart people. And they ask themselves the pertinent question. The correct question to ask. The question was really very simple. We have a crisis that is killing us. What do we do about it? <laughs> That's the obvious question to ask, right? Now, in Brussels, they had a meeting. The head of the central bank, the finance ministers, the bankers. But they didn't ask that question. They asked a different question. The question was, we have a set of rules to manage this euro of ours. They're not working. How can we pretend that they're working? Now, I submit to you, friends, that even if you ask, answer that question very cleverly, the result is a catastrophe. <laughs> and this is what we had. And we had millions and millions of people that suffered, uh, th th that suffered um, with no reason whatsoever. Except, of course, there is a reason that the European, the Central European oligarchy loves the architecture of the Euro. They love the fact that they, this irrational architecture is, is mana from heaven for them. Because from their perspective, they've achieved, um, you know, the, the best of all possible worlds for an oligarch. Central bank that has the right to give them money because the central bank has the right to pr print trillions to finance the oligarchs, but which has no right to finance any government. So no democratically elected government can be elected uh, with a mandate to redistribute wealth to the poor. So for an oligarch, you know, life can't get better than that. So when in 2010, and again now in 2020 with the pandemic, when it's abundantly clear that um, this system is broken, they see it too. They understand it. They're not dumb. But for them, it's far more important to preserve the original architecture of the user, which is good for the oligarchy, than to fix it. And this is why we have a Europe, which is the stupid continent of the world. Uh, every, every crisis that, takes, that happens leaves Europe, European capitalism, more wounded, weaker, with less investment. Um, and even though, you know, we have this feeling sensation that we are the civilized continent and that we are the smart ones and we have good education systems and uh, rubbish. What is happening is we are depleting our social and human and engineering and you know technological capital every year. You know we've ended up now uh, having fallen behind on everything. Artificial intelligence, uh, renewables, green energy, batteries, you know all the technologies of the future uh, Europe is terrible at. And, you know, we are the richest continent there is in the world, but we have a remarkable capacity to waste all, all this. So uh, I want to uh, bring us back to the present a little. Uh, I mean, um, it seems that the Minotaur uh, rather survived the crash of 2008, and we're now in 2021, and... Uh, it's still on, I think. Uh, so how is, how is the theory holding against the reality? And do you think the Corona crisis is the one that will free us from its death hug? Well, the second question I, I'm not sure I can answer because I have no prophetic powers. Um, but the first part of the question is interesting. Um, we, we are stuck in this limbo since 2008. Now, if you th think about it, in 1929, what is the fundamental difference between 19 1929 and 2008? It's not that now we have the internet and we, we have technology. No, the fundamental difference is the central banks. In 1929, the Fed didn't do anything. The banking system was collapsing and the Fed, the Fed was watching. So you had 
most of the banks went to the wall uh, and you had a much, much deeper recession compared to 2008. And then, you know, when Franklin Roosevelt came in, in, um, in 19, you know, late 1932 and was inaugurated uh, in 1933, he brings in the New Deal, starts pumping money in, into the economy, not through the central bank, but through the federal government, direct investment in the works program. Meanwhile, unfortunately, a, a different kind of Keynesianism was taking place in Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, it, and it was Keynesianism. It doesn't matter what Hitler was spending the money on. He was spending money, so he eliminated unemployment through massive government expenditure. As Keynes had said, you know, it doesn't matter what you spend it on. You might as well, you know, take the money and bury it in holes in, and then ask people to bury it out. Uh, unfortunately, Hitler was creating weapons of uh, human catastrophe. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, with the, by 1933-34, Right, um, the 1929 event had given its place to some kind of recovery. In 2008, having learned the lessons of 1929, and it is quite interesting that Ben Bernanke, who, is, who was the, the, the chairman of the Fed in 2008 in the United States, uh, his PhD was on 1929. Um, what they did was, they re responded. So they didn't let the banks fail, except Lehman's. Except Lehman's. And that was probably an accident or some kind of uh, antipathy towards the CEO of Lehman's. Uh, the, the rest they saved. In America, in Britain, in Germany, in France, they, you know, they printed trillions and they saved the banks. Think of those trillions as cortisone to a cancer patient. It makes the patient look reasonably perky and feel reasonably well, but it doesn't do anything with the tumor. This is why the period, what was equivalent between 1929 and 1932, those, those three years, 1929 to 1932, is the equivalent of our period from 2008 to now, to 12 years. It's been stretched out because of the palliative of central bank money which creates a semblance of normality, a semblance of recovery. And this is why people make the mistake of talking about the, the new crisis of the pandemic. It's not a new crisis, it's the same crisis. It has been um, reactivated, it has been reinvigorated by the virus, but it is the same crisis and it is the same thing that they're doing. What are they doing now? How are they dealing with it? They're printing more money and they're giving it to the same oligarchs. So we'd like to start talking about your new book, Another Now, and in it you lay some of the feature of an alternative society. And you propose, uh, among other things, the elimination of the labor market through what you call corpo syndicalism. So can you explain why is the elimination of the labor market so central in your view to overcoming capitalism? And what does your alternative look like? Well, there are two markets in capitalism that are the source of all evil, as I see. <laughs> the source of the crisis, the source of the inequality, the source of the poverty, and the source of the collective irrationality of the system. The two markets are the labor market and the financial market, and the money market, the share market, if you want. So in another now, I eliminate both. <laughs> uh, by eliminating the labor market, I don't mean, of course, that I eliminate labor, uh, but what I do is I eliminate the very strange relationship between capital and labor that we can take, it for, take for granted at the moment. I mean, think about it. Uh, at the moment, we have a system which considers it natural and rational and ethical that uh, there are people working in a company who do not own it, but produce the, the profits of it. And there are people who own the company who don't even, who haven't even visited the company. Um, they don't even know that, that they own the company. Now that, that, you know, that's the utmost irrationality. They don't even know that they, they own the company. If you think about it today, um, there are three companies in the United States, BlackRock, State Street, 
and Vanguard. Most people haven't heard of them. They own amongst themselves 90% of every American corporation listed in the New York stock market. Three companies own 90% of capital in the United States, right? Uh, they own the Bank of America, they own, you know, uh, um, Delta Airways, they own the whole thing. Uh, they own all Goldman Sachs. They own the whole thing, right? And so, you know, the, the, the people who own those companies don't even know, know what they own. Uh, so we consider this to be perfectly natural, right? Um, we, per we consider perfectly natural to have a situation where um, we have a financial market which is linked to a labor market as follows. Suppose you were to um, replace the CEO of any company today, of any company, of any large company, with an algorithm, you know, an algorithm, an app, um, or, you know, some, some kind of um, uh, lobotomized creature. And, and the moment this new CEO takes over, they make an announcement that they will fire 20% of the workforce in any company, whatever the circumstances are. I bet you that within five seconds, the share market of the company will go up massively. So it doesn't, I'm not talking about restructuring, I'm not talking about looking at the books of the company and finding out. No, just the mere announcement that you're going to fire workers is going to, to the stock market price to go up, which means that the CEO salary will go up because the CEO salary is linked to, <laughs> to the share price. And there's something criminally insane about this situation, right? Criminally insane. Um, moreover, it's not a liberal situation. You know, Adam Smith, the patron saint, the guru of most supporters of free markets, would be horrified by today's capitalism. Absolutely horrified. Adam Smith who is constantly quoted as the man who came up with the great idea that the market is the best way of organizing the world, life, um, scarce resources over means of production and so on. You know, he was very adamant. This thing works only when you've got the baker, the butcher and the brewer, small business people without any market power. The moment he was saying you introduce market power, you know, the power of Bezos, the whole thing becomes a dystopia, according to the patron saint of capitalism. <laughs> uh, the, the, what Adam Smith had not seen coming was that the moment you have, actually he had seen it, the moment you, you take ownership of companies and you fragment it, you cut it up in tiny little pieces called shares that can be traded anon anonymously like pieces of silver, then these pieces of silver will always concentrate in the hands of the very few. So the very few will own businesses. So the moment you have a stock exchange, which is liquid and boisterous like Wall Street or the city of London, right? The dream of liberal capitalism dies. The dream of Adam Smith dies. Uh, so what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to understand that shares are a bit like voting cards. Every share gives you one vote in the General Assembly of the stockholders. Now, in our democracies, would we ever accept a market for votes where you can actually sell your vote? I mean, we know that oligarchs try to buy people's votes. But would we want to make this official? And, you know, you, you can advertise, you can have an app where you sell your vote to the highest bidder. It would be absurd. I mean, people would be laughed uh, you know, out of court if they suggested that. But in the realm of business, we take this for granted that people actually buy votes. Because this is what you do when you buy shares in the company. The more shares you have, the more votes you have. So you end up with a situation where, given the concentration of capital, which is natural, in the hands of the very few, 
Uh, this whole thing about liberal democracy becomes a complete fallacy, a complete joke, because the moment you enter a company's door, you exit democracy. Outside, maybe there is democracy. But the moment you enter into a company, you enter in, into an institution where power rests with the people who bought the votes, the shareholders, right? And then suddenly you have a tug of war between those who work and don't own and those who own and do not work. And then, and once you get into this situation, you have a realization problem, as Karl Marx puts it. In other words, the factories can produce a lot more stuff, iPhones, gadgets, you know, car, electric cars, they can produce a lot more cars than what society can absorb, can afford. And then you have a crisis. You have an excess supply crisis. And then you need to destroy production, productive capacity, in, in order to do away with the excess. And this uh, involves either war, you know, bombardment, <laughs> killing people and destroying uh, factories, or it involves a huge crash, crash, a recession, like 2008, which destroys a lot of capacity through mass unemployment, and the dereliction of capital. So, why not extend the principle of democracy to the economy and simply say that um, we want a market society, a democratic market society. Um, everybody should have the right to join a company if they're hired and to leave the company um, if they don't like it there anymore and they can take their capital and go somewhere else and set up their own business or you know, create a, a business with other people, but that shares are like library cards in a university. Once you join the university, you get one of those library cards. You don't pay for it. It's given to you. Like, you know, um, uh, your, um, um, your identity card saying that, you know, I, 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 employee number 635, right? You get a share. It, you, you use it you can use it to vote in all the decision-making processes of the company. And then when you, when you leave the company, either because you resign or you retire, or maybe you are, you are fired by a democratic vote by everybody else, um, you hand it over. So suddenly, that's a long-winded answer to your question, uh, how would corporate syndicalism work? Corporations um, belong to those who work for them on the basis of a one employee, one vote, one share. Uh, and if you add to that a central bank, which gives a bank account, free bank, digital bank account to each one of us, suddenly banks are, have no monopoly over the payment system. Then you remove the money market and the labor market, and you keep all the other markets. And then you have markets with, without capitalism. So that's how corporal uh, syndicalism works, but uh, what about democracy itself? Uh, in the, I mean, we don't really talk about it in another now, about the question of governance, of national governance. International governance, you do talk, you have the, in the new institutions. Uh, apart from some citizen councils for the allocation of land, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, are they supposed to replace parties, parliaments, governments, uh, in say the governance of allocation, maybe even the definition of public goods? And another question uh, on this matter, that there's, there are some companies which cannot really be small. All the companies in this non-market, uh, uh, labor, non-labor market are rather small or medium, but say drug companies, which is... Like what companies? Drug companies. They usually have to be big because the risks they take and they're very expensive failures. So... Uh, well, I, I have personally worked in a company involving hundreds of employees, a huge, uh, um, uh, more than a billion dollars a year turnover, uh, which was operating on this basis. So um, we don't need companies that um, have, you know, 200,000 employees. Uh, with today's technology, information technology, with the apps and various uh, uh, technological aids, we can have a company that employs seven, six, eight thousand people, where we can actually make decisions collectively through our apps. Um, 
and, and coordinate beautifully. And let's face it, not everybody will be voting on every issue. Yeah, one of the, you know, once you reach a level of maturity, um, for instance, in our movement across Europe, DiEM25, we put everything up for a vote. You know, what should our policy be in, in, in that village in Bavaria regarding X? Well, not every DiEM has to vote on this. We have a rule that says a rule, a convention that we're trying to introduce saying, you have the right to vote, but please vote only on matters that matter to you and only on matters that you are slightly informed about. And people will respect it. And I think that, you know, a large corporation of 10,000 people can operate on, on that basis. Um, so, um, and, and you see, the beauty of this is that the, the moment you introduce one share, one person, one vote, the market itself and, the, uh, and society surreptitiously, without any state coming upon you and say, you, oh, you can't be bigger than that, creates an optimal size for firms. Uh, because, you know, take Amazon now, right? Or Facebook. How do we break it up? It needs to be broken up. There's no doubt about that. It's, they're just too large to be consistent with anything resembling democracy. But who decides how they're going to be broken up? Whereas if you say, okay, uh, one, one member, one share, one vote for its employees, okay? Then suddenly um, the people working on WhatsApp may think, well, look, it would be much easier for us to operate as a separate company from Facebook. And the people who operate on, who work on Instagram may decide, or they may not decide, or they may decide to create five different Instagrams. Right, because it will be better, you know, better for them. You know, each one of them is going to get more voice in doing this. And you let democracy decides the allocation of of companies or people to different companies. Because you asked me about democracy, where is democracy in my book? Well, it's actually deepened because you know I'm, I don't envisage the end of parliamentary democracy. Parliamentary democracy is important, but parliamentary democracy is 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 uh, mute and absolutely irrelevant when all the important decisions are taken behind closed doors in companies that are democracy-free zones. The moment you start democratizing companies, and I also have those councils um, where citizens are selected by sortition, by random, random draw, in order to oversee companies to see if what they are doing, even those corp corporate-syndicalist companies could go haywire and work against the public interest. And to say to them, look, you know, uh, I don't think you're, we don't think you, we're, you're working in the interest of society, uh, of, of your community. And, and, you know, you have to change A, B, C, or D, or otherwise, you know, somebody else will, will have to take over this company, other people. Um, so this is deepening democracy, democracy that goes deeper into the foundations, since you've read the book, and thank you for that, uh, on uh, uh, land management. You know, how do we separate commercial land zones from social land, uh, land used for social purposes? Uh, and, and, if, and if you empower these uh, citizens' collect assemblies, uh, where people are not elected, they are chosen by, you know, by means of the jury system, because elections are very oligarchic things. Remember, the, in ancient Athens, the Democrats hated elections and the oligarchs loved them because they could always manipulate them. So the Democrats were in favor of random draws, lots on lotteries. Even the judges were ch selected by lottery and they changed every six months. Okay. So I'd like to go back to your concept of capitalism with, oh, I, sorry, post-capitalism that has markets or markets without capitalism. And this seems like uh, a bit different from many past and present uh, visions of a socialist future. Because uh, despite the, mo most of these visions see uh, democratic economic planning as their central, uh, central tenant, and they call for the abolition of all markets, not only labor and capital markets, which you do. So why, why, why is it important to retain markets and goods and services in your vision? Is it because uh, is it because the benefits outweigh the other considerations? Is it not possible to create a, a non-market, democratically planned economy? No, no, no. Uh, but before I answer your question, let me tell those who have not read another now that um, 
uh, I wrote it as a novel, as a science fiction novel. And I wrote it as a novel precisely because I don't have all the answers. Uh, and I often disagree with myself. You see, if you write, if you write a, a book like The Global Minotaur, right, you have to tell people what you think. This is what I think happened then, this is why this is working like that, this is why this crisis took place. You have to be authoritative. Otherwise, you know, if you write a book and you say, I think it may be this, but it may be also the opposite. And you know what, I'm really not sure, maybe there is a third thing. They say, come on, mate, tell us what you think. Right? <laughs> um, but when it comes to planning a utopia or, you know, um, a post-capitalist world that's worth fighting for, uh, I personally don't have all the answers. I really don't. I, I, I often catch myself disagreeing with myself. So to answer your question more directly, um, part of me says we, need, we really need markets and because there's no subsidy to markets. Who's going to run the cafeterias? Who's going to run, um, you know, um, restaurants? Who's going to run, you know, who, who will produce games for people to actually buy and play on, on, on their smartphones. And you, you, do you really, even if you don't like video games, do you want to live in a society where people do not have access to games? That sounds very much like the Soviet Union, right? Very bleak and very grim. Uh, so you need to have markets um, in a world of scarcity. There's another part of me, um, the, 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 the communist part, who would like to, who loves the idea of um, uh, human beings that are, providing, you know, who enjoy doing stuff that everybody benefits from and they receive from everybody else according to their need, as Marx said. Um, for me, as you know, you probably know, I'm a Trekkie, I'm a Star Trek fanatic. For me, you know, Star Trek is the ideal communism because it's, pu you know, hugely liberal uh, but, and totally communist. There is no private property. You've got a, a hole in the wall called a replicator. You say, you know, I want to eat this. I want, you know, th this gadget. I want that. There are industrial replicators, large ones that can produce a car for you if you want, right? So there's no need for money and there's no need for ownership. And, you know, the, they build spaceships and explore the universe and answering philosophical questions. For me, that's the ideal. But I don't believe that this is around the corner. Whereas in another now, I wanted to describe uh, what could have happened in 2008, our generation is 1929, uh, and, and to create a plausible alternative history where by 2013, 2015, uh, there is another now. There is a, you know, markets and democracy without cap capitalism. For that, you need markets until you have replicators everywhere until you have an abundance, in, a, in other words. So let's uh, end uh, this session uh, in a note of hope or something like this. Uh, how realistic you think is another now uh, in the near future? Because when you look at what's happening now, it seems like it's going more and more in the dystopian direction. Uh, you think it can happen? I mean, you're optimistic? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Thank you very much, I'm sorry. Opti Thank optimism you. is for idiots. Only you, you have to be an, an idiot to look at the world, other world around you and to be optimistic. I'm hopeful. No, not optimistic. You think we can do optimistic it? Optimistic or not. You know, you, you, there is no empirical evidence pointing okay. to things happening. You think we can do it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is what, what chapter five in Another Now is all about. You know, how capitalism died. I, I even described the organizations that brought capitalism down, how they did it. I tried to imagine, you know, events that were feasible, that could be done if people actually did it. Uh, and not through heroism, but through organization, through smart organization. And through, um, you see, I, I, I don't want a revolution in which great heroic fig figures make huge sacrifices. Because if you have heroic figures making huge sacrifices, then their ego becomes great. And then when they get into power, they become Stalin or Robespierre or whatever, you know, you know what I mean, right? Uh, I want Lilipatians. I want each one of us to be a tiny little ant that does a little bit, so much, you know, small, small, tiny sacrifices, but where 
the power of the num of, of the large numbers multiplied by you know the little little effort of each one of us changes the world. So although we have many more questions, we'd love to ask. We do want to have some audience questions so for the next about uh, 20 minutes. And so I'll move the mic over to Noga, who will read them out. Hi. Um, so there are many, many good questions. It's a bit hard to choose. Um, but I'll start with a local political one. Um, the question is, do you have any ideas to share about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, occupation, etc.? In particular, anything somehow related to your ideas on economy and anti-capitalism? Okay. Give me some more so that I'm writing them down. Okay. Um, so there is another question. What is your opinion on MMT, modern monetary theory? Does financing states without affecting the broader market work, or is MMT just as futile as any attempt in history at financing debt through money printing? Mm -hmm. um, okay, another question. Do you think there is a good chance for a new social economical order as a, um, after the current crisis, which started in 2008 and goes on until the corona crisis? Okay, I can start with those if you want. Look, um, Israel-Palestine. Um, it's, it's an issue that, that, that's very close to my heart. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult issue, there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, none of us have uh, the right to skirt it and not to address it head on. So let me tell you, um, I won't give you the, my whole um, I, you know, thinking about it. If, if you go into, into the DiEM25 uh, YouTube channel, you'll find that recently um, I made a statement for about 10 minutes as part of the DiEM25 coordinating committee talking about anti-Semitism and how to decouple anti-Semitism from criticisms of Israeli policies in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, but now I'll, I'll go straight to the heart of the issue. Uh, for many years, I was hoping that my friend Joseph Halevi was wrong, because I remember in 1991, the same Joseph Halevi I was referring to before, um, he, he, he was absolutely convinced that the Oslo Accords were a catastrophe. And he believed that, don't get him wrong, from a left-wing perspective. He believed that it would, not get, it would not culminate into anything good, and that in the end it would make the life of both Palestinians and Israelis and progressive Israelis unbearable. And I thought he was wrong at the time. Uh, but there was somebody else too that had the same kind of animosity towards the Oslo Accords. Um, Edward Said, if you remember, the great scholar, Palestinian scholar. Uh, and what both Joseph and Ed were getting at was that uh, the colonization of uh, the West Bank, the manner in which the whole conflict had created facts on the ground, made it highly problematic to be talking about a two-state solution. Now, initially, I was very much in favor of a two-state state solution. You know, to you know, Israel and Palestine next to each other in peace and harmony, cooperation and so on. Uh, I think that, the, that, that both Edward Said and Joseph were right. The Oslo process uh, made that so toxic, so impossible, that now the only hope I have is for a United State, a state that is neither Jewish, nor um, Arab, but it is a common home where the major issue is addressed as a question of civil liberties, an anti-apartheid movement within a common land. 
Um, I know that, you know, I, I've, if I say this within my political party, Mera 25, I'm going to be lambasted and, and, and you know, I'm probably a minority of one. Um, uh, when I talk to Palestinian friends of mine who say, and what right do you have to say to us that our aspiration to have our own state is, 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 is dead? So I, I'm sharing this view with you as, you know, as somebody who is not sure about himself. I'm sharing a hunch effectively, not a policy. My hunch is that the possibility of two progressive states, Israel and Palestine, next to each other, operating autonomously and with mutual respect, the probability of that now is zero. Not low, zero. But the probability of a common country that is um, uh, secular uh, and uh, in which um, uh, you know, Jews and, and, and Palestinians can live together, or Arabs can call them whatever you want, can live together, is very hard, but the probability is not zero. Now, you know, and I would like you to, to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't have strong views on this. I have, I have very um, uh, passionate views, but not uh, intellectually strong ones. Um, I'm, I'm searching for answers regarding this. But I do not see the Israeli political system the administration in Ramallah or Hamas in Gaza as being capable of negotiating a two-state solution. Uh, it's far more likely that... You know, what, you know what I would like to see? I would like to see a progressive movement of uh, everybody in the region overthrowing all those bastards and creating a, a, a common home, a common state for everyone. That's what I would like to see. Call me complete a complete idiot if you wish um mmt for those of you who don't know what mmt is uh mmt it's modern money theory the reason why it's called modern money is because they, they uh and the, these people the mmt crowd are most of them are very good friends of mine uh i do not count myself as an mmt theorist i refer to myself as mmt friendly <laughs> <laughs> because there are things I don't agree with, with them. They, 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 they tend to, you know, all economists do that. They, they tend, they, they become messianic. They think, oh, I've got my theory now, I've solved, solved the, the problems of the world. I don't think that it's uh, that simple. But I agree with them in their conception of money. Their conception of money is absolutely spot on. You see, most, most people are under the false impression that money is a commodity. It's a bit like, you know, silver coins. Silver coins are commodities. Yeah, it's, it's bits of silver. Uh, money is not that. Money is, as Marx put it, it's the alienated power of humanity. <laughs> uh, and in a sense, the state produces money. And as long as the state produces the money in which it borrows, no state can ever go broke. So public debt is not an issue. If your debt is in the currency that you control. And that is correct. That is correct. So those who say, ah, we've got to rein in public debt, so we need to do austerity. This is a kind of class war. There is no theoretical foundation in this. And from a monetary point perspective, it's completely wrong. Now, if you do not control your own currency, like Greece doesn't, or Ecuador. Ecuador has the dollar, Greece has the euro. Then debt matters because you are not printing the money in which your debt is denominated. Uh, for Israel, it doesn't count either because much of your debt is in dollars and you do not print dollars. So MMT is particularly pertinent in the case of the United States, in the case of the United Kingdom, in countries where the debt, the public debt, is denominated in the currency. But more generally, let me say that, and okay, so this is where I agree with MMT theorists. Let me tell you where I disagree with them. They don't pay particular attention to capitalism. <laughs> they don't, buy, you know, it is as if, if, if you sort out the monetary policy and you keep printing money to create jobs and create the jobs guarantee scheme and so on, the problems of capitalism go away. The problems of capitalism do not go away as long as you have share markets and as long as you have financial markets. That's, that, that's where I depart from them. 
I'm a bit more radical. Um, and on the question of you know, do we envisage a new economic order as possible? Absolutely. This is why you know our movement, um, DM25 across Europe and Meta25 agrees. We've been working on the Green New Deal now for many years. I've been working on a Green New Deal um, since the early 2000s, at the same time that the global minotaur idea was taking shape. So I do believe that a, 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 a new progressive economic order is, is, is feasible. Um, I've done quite a lot of work in describing the institutions, the international institutions we need, not only in Europe but beyond. Uh, I don't think it's enough. I think that we need to move towards post-capitalism. Uh, in, be, because capitalism cannot be civilized in the end, it can only be restrained to some extent for a certain period of time, as it was in the 1950s and 60s, but then at some point it will again escape, the genie will escape the bottle and start doing horrible things. Um, and in any case, I don't believe that it is possible to continue along the tunnel. I mean, capitalism is already morphing into what I call techno-feudalism, with a large, small, huge corporations like Amazon and so on, and the state producing the money to support them. Already we have capitalists moving into a new economic order, except that this is a dystopic one. So we need to move to a capitalism that is, you know, um, consistent with basic human values and democracy. Okay, um, thank you. There are more questions. I think we still have a bit of time left, right? Yep. Okay, so one that is related to what you just said. Um, isn't centralized democratic planning necessary to deal with the environmental crisis? Um, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We need, we need to have, in the same way that, you know, we have a constitution that bans um, um, violations of human rights, we need to ban violations of uh, environmental rights. Uh, and the rights of the environment, not so much of human environmental rights. So I'm completely in favor of uh, limits to physical growth, you know, hard barriers. Um, we cannot produce more than so many tons of cement. End of story. Let's decide what that must be and stay there. Um, I'm totally against the creation of fake markets the markets for bads, you know, like emissions trading schemes and all that. This is, these are just schemes by which finances can become wealthy while we miss all the targets. I do believe in taxes, carbon taxes, and that has to be part of a central plan. But that's not the same thing as, um, um, you know, simply replacing private ownership of the large monopolies with the state ownership of the large monopolies. I'm still a liberal deep down, and I thought I think Marx was a liberal deep down, in the sense that you know um, uh, progressives must fear the power of the monopolies uh, and the corporate barons, but also fear the power of the state and of the bureaucracy. I know, for instance, that in the Soviet Union I would be in the gulag. There's no doubt about that. Okay, um, so there are many different questions in, on, in different subjects. Um, do you want me to give you a few in a row or? Yeah, I'm writing them down. Okay, so uh, one question is, what is in your opinion, the classic model of how the global basic income should work and how can we prevent the capitalist establishment to, dis to, to disrupt it in the near future? Mm -hmm. um, another, another one is, can you please talk a bit about the Progressive International and how we can take part in it? What are the expectations regarding the Progressive International? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just a moment. Uh, okay, how do you think it's possible to tackle the rise of right-wing populism, the rise of anti-left-wing elite movements? Okay. Shall I have a go? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I've written extensively on basic income, on universal basic income. I am all for it. I, and in another, another now, one of the features of another now is what I call a universal basic dividend. And the reason why I use the word dividend is because I want people to understand that we are all contributors 
to society's capital. Um, take the vaccines, for instance, that BioNTech produced, Pfizer, no? or AstraZeneca, or Moderna. Uh, yeah. Now, they're taking, taking all the profits as if they contributed all the capital. They contributed capital, there's no doubt about that. But, you know, who educated the scientists? Who gave all these grants to those companies to be set up in the first place? It was the state. It was, you know, citizens. Citizens contributed to the whole culture that made some scientists capable of inventing a vaccine. And yet society never gets any dividends from that. Every time you check your mobile phone, you know, you add to the capital of Google and Facebook. Every time you upload a photo, same. And you, and you, and, and, so you're a, a contributor to their capital, not a customer, a contributor to their capital. It's like, you know, being one of the engineers that creates some of the cogs of the machine. And yet you get no return for that capital. That capital is privately owned. So this is why I believe that, you know, the, we, we, it's wrong to start arguing that on the, on, on the base of fairness, that there is too much inequality and some of the money has to be distributed as universal banking income. No, 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 no. It is your right to be paid because as a citizen, you have contributed to the social capital. Uh, and secondly, I don't believe that uh, you, the universal basic income should be paid for by taxation. Uh, because who pays taxes? It's the little people who pay taxes. The rich uh, uh, big wigs do not pay taxes. <laughs> they pay no, almost no taxes. So it's like, you, might, you, might, you, know, you go to a taxi driver or you go to a factory worker and you say to her or to him, um, we will take some of your income to give to somebody who is not working. Maybe they don't want to work. Maybe they, they are bums, you know, watching television or surfing in Australia. Or maybe they're rich people, because that's what universal means. They will say, what? You know, I'm struggling, you know, at work every day, and you're going to take money of mine and to give it as a basic income to somebody else? No, I don't want that. So I'm against funding a UBI, universal basic income, through taxation. So how should it be funded? Directly from the central bank. The central banks print money anyway. Print a bit of money for people. Uh, and secondly, far more importantly, or equally importantly, um, take a share, until we reach the one share, one person, one vote, you know, take 10% of shares of every large corporation and put it in an equity fund. Uh, the dividends accumulate there and then you distribute them to everyone. So this is, you know, this is my take on UBD, I call it, the Universal Basic Dividend. Uh, Progressive International, look, the Progressive International happened um, uh, almost by accident. It was not planned. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, three years ago, I was asked to write an article by The Guardian on what the world needs to counter Trumpism, to counter the, the liberal establishment. And I, I decided I'm going to write an article against the two authoritarianism, the authoritarianism of the so-called liberal establishment and the authoritarianism of the quasi-fascists or fascists like Donald Trump, Salvini, Orban, and so on. Um, and um, I finished off by saying that, you know, the bankers of the world have united to create an international. The fascists of the world are cooperating brilliantly. You know, Modi, Trump, uh, Netanyahu, all of them, they love each other. They're really... A, they show immense solidarity with, with one another. Our bastards here in Greece, you know, uh, excuse my French. Uh, the only people who have not created an international are the internationalists, the progressives. It's not the time we did it. So I, I wrote this, it was an article. And lo and behold, I find out that The Guardian gave this article to Bernie Sanders, who liked it and wrote a very nice write-up at the end, saying that he agrees entirely that we need a progressive international and that's what we should do. So the Guardian asked him to write also an article and then asked me to comment on it. So the two articles appeared side by side, including the, my commentary on his and his commentary on mine. Just a slim paragraphs at the end. And then, so we, came, we, we got in touch. We hadn't been in touch since 2015, Bernie and I. And uh, um, he invited me to go to Vermont to some gathering of progressives. And there we decide we're going to make a call to say to people, open call. Who wants to join the Progressive International? <laughs> and then uh, something intervened, the, a presidential election <laughs> intervened. And you know how the United States is, you know, it's just appalling. Um, 
anybody who is involved in the presidential election is not allowed to have any, any dealings with anyone, any foreigner. So suddenly he was not, you know, their side was not able to be part. They had to, to stay away from it. But anyway, the, the rest of us continued it. So together with, you know, Noam Chomsky, Lula, uh, Arundhati Roy, the wonderful uh, author from India, um, uh, Naomi Klein, various pe people, um, you know, we, we continued this thing. And we launched the Biodate nine months ago. Now we are up and running. We have a council uh, that um, meets every month. We have a secretariat that meets every week. Uh, we started with a campaign against Amazon. We mobilized 200 million workers around the world in the strike against Amazon uh, under the hashtag make Amazon pay. Um, now we're in Ecuador monitoring the election there. Uh, we were in Bolivia. Um, we are organizing trade unions and, 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 and climate activists and women's groups in Namibia, in South Africa and so on. Um, you can join as a member, but it would be much better if you could have some organization, either a trade union, some institution that you put together in Israel and you joined up. Um, uh, just go to Progress International and you know, to, to our website and join through there and become part of this uh, of this organization. And finally, how do we fight right-wing populism? That's how we fight, fight right-wing populism. Through um, uh, transnational, internationalist um, um, cooperation, because we cannot do it in our own homes, in our, in, our ho in our own homelands separately. We just cannot do it. They cooperate internationally, they are internationalism in action. We have to respond in kind. So thank you very much. Although I'm sure there are many, many more questions. Uh, we're sadly out of time. Uh, I'd like to call people again to, I said it in Hebrew, I'll say it in, in English now, but to purchase the new translation of the book, by Asmi, the translation by Asmina Levy, the book, The Global Minotaur. And I'd like to, we both would like to thank you very much for, for being thank with you. us.